Business session of the City Council will come to order. We have a quorum. Uh, first order of business is approval of minutes from the business session of September 21, 2017. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Are there any additions, deletions, corrections? Hearing none, all in favor of the approving the minutes as written, say aye. 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 All opposed? There are no opposed. Next item of business is the Valley View Community Improvement District public hearing. Uh, this next item uh, on the agenda is a public hearing for the Valley View Community Improvement District. Purpose of the hearing is to consider the advisability of establishing the Valley View Community Improvement District and sim simultaneously removing certain property from the Shoal Creek Valley Community Improvement District pursuant to the requirements of state law governing community improvement districts. If after considering the documents received, testimony and discussion, the council deems it advisable, then an ordinance will be introduced for those purposes. Will the clerk call the roll to determine that we have a quorum and record the same, please? Wagner? Here. Hall? Present. Lohr? Here. Fowler? Here. Lucas? Reed? Present. Shields? <laughs> Justice? Here. Barnes? Present. Kennedy? Taylor, McManus, here. James. I, uh, here. Nine members present. Uh, there is a quorum for the hearing. The clerk will report on the notice for the hearing. Mayor James and Mayor James and Council members, uh, notice for this hearing has been published as required by the Community Improvement District Act, and a copy of the notice is on file in the office of the city clerk. In addition, notice has been mailed to the property owners as required by law, and a certification of mailing same is on file in the office of the city clerk. Uh, the council will now take up the public hearing concerning the district. And will the clerk report on the petition? Pursuant to the requirements of state law, no, the proponents I'm of the Valley View Community Improvement District have filed petitions with the city clerk to establish a district. Upon information received from the Information Technology Department and the City Planning and Development Department, I have certified that the petition has been signed by property owners collectively owning more than 50% by assessed value of the real property within the boundaries of the, of the proposed district and that the petition has been signed by more than 50% per capita of all the owners of real property within the boundaries of the proposed district. Furthermore, the board of the Shoal Creek Valley Community Improvement District has consented to the removal of certain real property from its district. Upon information from the city attorney, the requirements of the Community Improvement District Act have been met. Will the clerk present any proposed amendments to the district unrelated to the boundaries? and any written objections to the district or any other amendments or written objections related to removal of the property from Shoal Creek Valley. No amendments or objections have been received. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to present amendments or written objections at this time? And if so, please present them to the city clerk. Is there any such person? I see no people. Well, I see no people wanting to do that anyhow. <laughs> If there's anybody who would like to present amendments or objections orally or otherwise testify, would you please come up and state your name and address before you testify? Are there any who want to do that? I see none. Is there any discussion by council? Well, Mayor James, we're, I'm just happy to, um, to be the sponsor of this today, and I'm looking forward to having a little bit of a presentation about it. I'm sorry, say what now? I have, a, I have some people here who would like to give a presentation about it. Okay, cool. It'll be brief. I know we have a No, go there. ahead. Not a problem. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor Kurt Peterson with Pulsinelli here on behalf of... Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I know the cameras are here for this, so uh, we will make sure to go very quickly. <laughs> Just for you. Cover the other news of the city. But so you, you knew the us. cameras were coming and they sent you. <laughs> okay. Something like that. All right. Thank you, Mayor and Council, for uh, hearing us here briefly just give you an overview of this proposed Valley View Community Improvement District. I hear, I am here on behalf of the Applicant Star Development. Uh, for the record, since this is a public hearing, Wilson at 900 West, 48th place in this city. Um, the our presentation here, we have a very brief slide so you can see the property we're talking about. In the corner. I can help finding oh, it. There right there. Yep. So the property we're talking about for this proposed Valley View Community Improvement District is west of I-35 on the north side of 150 between uh, Flintlock to the east and Shoal Creek Parkway to the west. I still don't know, so they can see it. There you go. Thank you very much. So you can see the arrow indicates where we're at, right below what everyone likes to call. Go ahead and pull that microphone a little closer sure. to you, would you please? Thank you, Mayor. That's all right. 
as you can see on the screen before you, the arrow indicates where the where the subject property is below what we like to call the witch's hat. There, the golf course is kind of a hat over the property. The proposed project is the project you see just on the north side of 152 with the peach looking buildings. That's approximately 107,000 feet of new uh, top restaurant and retail space, perhaps a little bit of office. Uh, the problem with this nice looking uh, project in this location is it requires an enormous amount of public infrastructure improvements to be able to move forward, just under $10 million for 107,000 square feet of commercial space. So for that reason, we came before uh, this body and worked together with the existing Shoal Creek TIF Advisory Committee and the TIF Commission, and were able to get some support to pay for a good portion of that uh, public infrastructure, which we hope to start later this year. To be good stewards, to try to minimize the amount of TIF that was necessary for the public infrastructure, we've proposed a community improvement district. The community improvement district would add a 1% CID sales tax, no special assessments, and it would be a sales tax just on this proposed new development. It would generate sales tax proceeds that would help to reduce the amount of TIF that would be necessary to help build these public improvements. To be clear, the CID is all about building these public improvements and nothing more. You can see the outline of red on your screen shows the proposed boundaries of the CID. Uh, it is exactly uh, coterminous with the boundaries of this new proposed commercial project just mentioned. Um, as I said, it's a CID 1% sales tax, no CID assessments. It, it will generate an estimated about $1.5 million towards the just under $10 million of public infrastructure uh, plus financing cost, and then a more detailed version of that just indicates exactly which public improvements we think the CID would pay for, which would be, uh, going back to this screen, the Shoal Creek, uh, Shoal Creek Valley Drive, which is the east-west street that bisects this development that stubs on either end. It's a little small, I know, on the screen, but stubs right now on either end, and we would continue that. would not only actually serve our development mayor, but also serve all the future development to the north and everyone else that's trying to cut through and relieve traffic on Missouri Highway 152. With that, I will keep it brief, but would like to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Any council discussion? Councilwoman Hall, anything? I just am pleased that you're bringing this before us. This is something that we definitely have been wanting to have happen to fill that space. That's kind of an awkward space there in the uh, 152 corridor. And I know that um, my colleague and I have been help working with the Shoal Creek TIF and you all to try and find out a way to make that work. And I think this is a great way. Well, we appreciate your support, Councilwoman. Thank you. Any further discussion, Mr. Buckhouse? Uh, Councilman Lucas. Um, somewhat related, I would actually just ask the city manager, during, um, I believe, the end of 2016, we had some discussion on community improvement districts, policy changes, and that sort of thing, and had a um, study related to that, uh, I think, being conducted by staff. Could you give us just a, an update on where that is? Uh, no? We just are putting the final touches on the response. You should maybe get it as early as uh, tomorrow. How about that? So, Thank uh, you. It's, uh, and it's for single-purpose CIDs to modify that proposal. <laughs> Thanks. Anyone else? If there's no further discussion, is there a motion? That would be you. Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> if I get to make the motion, I'm excited. Mayor, uh, Mayor James, I move that the council do the following. Approve the petition submitted and verified by the city clerk for the creation of the Valley View Community Improvement District. And sure. approve the creation of the Valley View Community Improvement District. Simultaneous removal of property described by resolution 2017-05 from the Shoal Creek Valley Community Improvement District. And I request that the city attorney prepare an ordinance to approve the petition and establish the Valley View Community Improvement District in the council's legislative session. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing no discussion on the motion, the clerk will call the roll on the motion. Wagner. Aye. Hall. Aye. Lore. Aye. Fowler. Aye. <coughs> Lucas. Aye. Reed. Aye. Shields. Justice. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. <coughs> Taylor. Aye. McManus. Aye. James. Aye. Twelve ayes. Uh, the motion is passed. An ordinance will be introduced to formally establish the Valley View Community Improvement District and remove the real property from Shoal Creek Valley uh, Shoal Creek Valley Improvement District. And that concludes the hearing. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Next item of business. We still see you. <laughs> Next item of business, KCI update. Councilwoman Justice, Councilman Reed. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council.
Council. It's my understanding that today we're going to be, have, be having a report from the Edgemore team, including their architectural um, firm, to look at yeah, the good. new design um, principles for uh, KCI. Welcome. Good afternoon, Council members. Patrick Klein, Aviation Director. I've got some members of our team here with Edgemore. Um, I'm going to let them do self-introductions, and then we'll get right to the to the uh, PowerPoint. I've got about an hour of comments. I'm just kidding. And then we'll see the renderings. <laughs> good, Jeff? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Jeff Stryker with Edgemore. Uh, Derek Moore with the part of the Edgemore team, uh, Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill Architects. I'm Peter Lefkowitz from Skidmore, Owings, and Merrill Architects. Fantastic. Thank you. This group has been working uh, hard for the last couple of weeks. We've uh, they were in a building across the street from our administrative office. There's about 20,000 square feet, so they moved right in and uh, started work. And we're going to kick it off and let Jeff tell you about the work they've done and then uh, move to Derek and go through the renderings. <coughs> Thanks, Pat, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. I really thought the cameras were here for the other gentlemen. So <laughs> um, I'm going to just spend a few minutes giving a quick update on what uh, we've been doing over the last several weeks, and then I'll turn it over to the design team to walk specifically through the, the renderings and the themes. So we've been moving forward on sort of five key fronts. Um, first is working to support the campaign efforts that are ongoing uh, daily. Uh, but providing both people and resources, and we recognize the importance uh, of our team's involvement uh, in the campaign and are working with the team to ensure that the campaign is successful. Uh, we've been invited to and accepted through uh, with the campaign and on our own over a dozen events uh, to speak at in the month of October, and uh, we had two yesterday, and they seem to be filling up on my calendar as much as probably the council members here in front of me and the mayor. Um, so, so we will continue to do that throughout the month leading up to the referendum. The second thing that we've continued to do is work on community and stakeholder engagement. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we've had nearly two dozen meetings with various groups all across the city. Uh, we've met with Chambers of Commerce, the Kansas City Chamber, the Northland Chamber, Hispanic Chamber, um, uh, various construction entities, uh, minority contractors, Hisp Hispanic Contractors Association. Um, we are working on a second outreach event. Uh, as folks know, about two weeks ago, we had a first event at the Gem Theater in District 3. We are working on, we'll be announcing uh, probably in the beginning of next week, a second outreach event to be held in District 5 to, again, continue outreach to the MBE and WBE community. Um, and then lastly, we are working on furthering the development of the programs that are specific to the community benefit agreement that was in the ordinance that was passed, 170663. And so we are furthering all those elements, whether it's transportation, on-site, uh, health care, the daycare, et cetera. Um, we have also set up a project-specific website that has information about not only our team, but opportunities for uh, consultants and contractors to register, if they hadn't, have not registered already, to participate as opportunities to bid come out. And uh, that website is kci-edgemoor.com. -E that is also where the renderings that uh, my colleagues from SOM uh, we'll be discussing here in a moment, will be posted shortly, and I, I believe the city is posting it on their website as well. Um, third thing we've uh, been working on is what uh, many of you have heard me refer to as the open arms policy. We are um, furiously working to build out the design team. We've got about two dozen interviews scheduled. We've started some in, in over the next couple of weeks, um, and we'll continue to do that and, and add firms, both um, major and uh, major prime subs, as well as uh, MBE, WB, and, and minor subs uh, throughout the, the coming months through the end of the year. And then once we get to the first of the year, we'll turn and start looking at uh, construction plans. <coughs> <coughs> the fourth item we've been working on is negotiating the MOU with the city. We got our first draft at the end of last week. We had a, a very positive session yesterday with the attorneys, and we'll continue to move that forward as quickly as we can. And then the last piece, of course, and, and the reason I think uh, everyone is here today is we've been uh, diligently at work furthering the design of the project. Um, we have had weekly meetings with the aviation department now for four weeks running. That has included um, the airlines as well, so they've been a, an active partner in our discussions. Um, as Pat said, we've uh, been fortunate enough that they had some empty space across the street on Mexico City Avenue from their building, so we have co-located there and are staffing up today and have several people there, you know, eight, nine to five or in many cases far beyond that. Um, we also have a meeting set up with the FAA in about uh, 10 days to talk about the project. Um, so just to, to set up uh, my colleagues here from SOM, 
you know, after we got the award, the first thing we did was work with the aviation department and get all the work that had been done that had created the Exhibit K memorandum. We had, um, in essence, the summary level information, so we went back and had all the detailed information. So we reviewed that, sy synthesized that, as well as took all the work that the aviation department had already started, and we've been in the process of, of furthering that. Um, the vision, the design vision that you'll see here is what we've worked together collaboratively with the aviation department, airline partners, and, and all their consultants, and, and we're very excited about what you'll see here in a moment. You know, the, the last thing is, as we've been working on this, we on the development side, as well as my colleagues here on the design side, we've really challenged ourselves to meet several objectives. Um, we've heard loud and clear the convenience factor of the current airport and making sure we replicate that in, in the new single terminal, and I think you'll be very pleased with, with how we represent that. Uh, the second piece is improved amenities within the terminal, whether that is retail, whether that is um, having a USO, whether that is having kids play areas. You'll see some of that imagery I in what you're about to see. The third piece uh, is around sustainability. We've really had a big focus on making sure that um, the commitment that we put forward to lead gold will be met, so we've started to employ strategies uh, in looking at um, sustainability as part of our project. And then the last thing, which I think uh, is perhaps the most important, is to our team and airport, uh, and especially this, which we see as a gateway terminal, is the first thing anybody will see when they come to Kansas City, and it's the last thing they see when they leave. And gosh darn it, when they get off the plane, they better know they're in Kansas City. And so we've worked really hard to uh, reflect the wonderful heritage of Kansas City in our design. And you'll see uh, some uh, themes in the various renderings around fountains, around boulevards, around 18th and Vine, and the wonderful cultural history there. Um, but the designs we're showing today are our initial concepts. We're not done with our design. Um, it's a collaborative process. And as many of you recall, we uh, want to integrate the community into our process. Um, so what we plan to do uh, going forward is schedule in each council member's districts uh, in the months of November and December, uh, design <coughs> open house where we will have a meeting, whether it's in a library or a community center or a high school, and get feedback from the community on the elements of our design, what they like, what they don't like, and then gather that. Because ultimately what we want to make sure is that we have a can uh, an airport that reflects the values and the aspirations of Kansas City. And so with that, we're very excited about what we have today, and I will turn it over to Derek. Great. Thank, thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Yes, ab absolutely. Uh, to reiterate something that, is, am I on? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, Jeff said it's been a, a, a very collaborative, interactive process uh, to date. Um, and uh, I, it's been set up clearly on that basis, the whole, the whole milieu of the, of the, uh, of the airport. Um, next, please. So I want to say a few general things, sort of umbrella remarks about the way the, our entire team approaches this 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 sort of project, and the way I think a lot of people think about about airports and, and airport terminals. And as Jeff said, they are clearly a reflection of the values uh, of of the place, and that's not just in in physical forms, but it's also in the hospitality and the and the convenience and so forth. Next, please. Um, but they're also uh, incredibly uh, I uh, complicated machines in, 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 man in many ways. We understand that the airlines uh, need to be able to operate at maximum e efficiency. And it also needs to be last o over, over time. All of that uh, will be in the, in the new terminal. Um, they're also um, very important economic drivers, as you, as you well know. We think that there's roughly a, a billion uh, in, in impact, in economic impact of this of this uh, of this project, and of course that lasts uh, over time. Next, um, there's also above all, really, there they are places for people. They are for for the for the citizens of Kansas City, the visitors, and hopefully the new people that will be attracted uh, to the, to the city, expressing <coughs> their values. So as as Jeff also said. Um, we are we are we've begun and we will now widen out this interactive process uh, with with the community and with other with other stakeholders as we as we go ahead some of the the, the values though the this very much more project specific issues that that we are are, are baking into the design now uh, and <laughs> we will be repeating it uh, throughout uh, of course is that 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 comparable convenience to the to the existing airport terminals. We want this to be as loved as 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 those have been. The, there'll be a lot more space, though, for amenities in the in the in the new terminal of the kinds that Jeff said and and kinds that we will discover uh, over the over the process. 
the efficiency has to be there both in the, in the, in the scoping and in the long-term flexibility. The sustainability, uh, Jeff mentioned also, the lead gold target, but how can we set up for what our future future optimization in sustainability as, the, as we move forward. Technology that is there today, that, that is rapidly increasing both for passenger convenience, but also for, for operations. And we hope to be able to set up the, the building for an ever more seamless uh, flow from, from curb to gate and, and back again. And this last item of, of the heritage is, is something that, that we try to bring to every, every one of our, our projects. And the city is, of course, rich, rich in that, both in past, present, and also aspirationally the heritage of the future, so to speak, that we, we want to embody in the, in the, in the building. So uh, with that, and as Jeff said, initial, uh, initial design themes that, that we want to weave in. So this is a, a view of the approach to the terminal. We, we want to be able to continue the, the landscape of the airport and, and make reference to the green boulevards of, of, this, of the city. We've even put, we're proposing to put a, a, a small garden adjacent to baggage claim on the ground level with a fountain for, for an amenity to look at, an amenity to, to enjoy for your pets also. Um, it's a two level, it's a two level terminal. So the arrivals curb will be right at the building. The departures curb will be right at the building. You also see in the, in the rendering, I hope there'll be a, a high level pedestrian connector from the upper levels of the garage. That garage is right there, just the way it is today and perhaps even, perhaps even closer in some, in, in some ways. Um, the building will, we hope, have um, large glass walls to give that sense of, of visibility. You should be able to see from that, that bridge from the garage, you should be able to see through the building to those immediate gates. And the gates are right, the, a, a large number of the gates are right there uh, after, after the security uh, checkpoint. So this, this building and the, the imagery is, is, this is a first proposal. We want it to evoke certain topographical and other themes of the of the of the city, the landscape, the wider the wider region. Um, but let's go inside the, the building, and Peter will will take us through some of the elements there. Yeah, thank you, <coughs> everybody, for the opportunity to present and um, some initial thoughts on what it feels like to be a passenger in this terminal, departing and uh, arriving through the terminal. So on the screen. Uh, we have an <coughs> illustrative image um, of the check-in hall. So on the right side of the image, you've entered uh, from the drop-off roadway, uh, making your way to the left of the image, processing through check-in uh, and eventually through security. Um, that little mezzanine projecting up there, that's the direct connection from the parking garage that Derek mentioned. So you'll have a direct link directly from parking, directly into the terminal. Uh, weather protected can be conditioned as well, so you're not in the elements as you cross go across. Um, the main check-in hall, we want to be a grand space, light and airy. Um, it'll be designed around natural daylight. Uh, we'll harvest natural daylight so you have less reliance on electrical lighting, so to reduce your energy output and your energy loads throughout the year. Uh, but also the light will be a way of uh, letting people navigate through the building. They can follow the light. It'll be a natural, intuitive way to kind of go through the building. Um, sight lines will be very open, so once you check in, you'll know where your next step is. You'll be able to clearly see security. Um, and the layout and the design will be built uh, to some of the points that Derek mentioned. It can house all the latest technology and infrastructure for passenger processing, check-in, uh, what whatever the latest trends are in terms of technology and check-in as well. One of the key features that we've been looking at, if you go to the next slide, uh, as a, a kind of memorable moment that is unique to Kansas uh, City, uh, the idea that it's the city of fountains and that there would be a fountain as a kind of central uh, focal piece of the departures check-in hall. Uh, and using the latest technologies, these can be essentially it's a 21st century water fountain uh, or water feature, uh, and it can be programmed to do a variety of things. So throughout the day, it could have a kind of gentle uh, flow of water. You'd hear the sound of water, so it calms you down. Uh, Check-in and security is typically a very, uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, scary time for people. So if we can kind of bring down the heart rate, make people feel calm. Uh, hearing the sound of water would be a great device for that, in addition to being a kind of great visual. If you click to the next slide, 
It could also be programmed uh, uh, throughout the day, <coughs> throughout the year for specific events, uh, for holidays, for, uh, you know, if, if there's a sports team that wins their, their title, uh, even on the hour, you could have a great event that people get to see. All can be programmed into these water features. Uh, so that would be distinct for this terminal and uh, distinct in the world of airports. Nobody else has done anything like this, and we think it would be a great uh, uh, kind of hats off to the city of Fountains. So on the next slide. Next, then, we're transitioning to one of the uh, retail offering areas. Um, it's designed as a kind of open piazza, a kind of central space where people can sit, they can gather, uh, you can take in the sites around you. Um, it's an opportunity to incorporate performances, uh, showcasing all of the local arts uh, of the Kansas City districts, um, d highlighting different neighborhoods, and also bringing in local culture and local businesses as well, highlighting local businesses, uh, uh, local designers, local tradesmen um, in the retail offerings as well. And as Derek mentioned as well, there's great opportunities for the incorporation of airline lounges, the USO, um, a lot more amenities and spaces. So you can see it'd be a kind of a central space that everyone gathers around, uh, you can get a bite to eat, you can take in an impromptu jazz uh, session, uh, but also at the same time you can still see where you're going. You can see the gates beyond, you can see the aircraft beyond, so you always have a sense of where you're going, follow the light, uh, so it's very open and transparent. Next slide. And then as you transition, um, this is a, a view depicting what a, a typical gate lounge might be. So this is that moment before you get on the plane, uh, typically where you spend a lot of time dwelling. Uh, and we want to make that as comfortable as possible. So again, the sight lines are very open. You can see the aircraft. Uh, you can see where the boarding gates are, where you need to go. We're potentially using color as a device. Uh, so you use it as a wayfinding device. You follow the blue. You know that's where I need to go or follow what the color is. Um, but we've also incorporated to ensure people are comfortable. There'll be lounges. Uh, there'll be food and <laughs> beverage offerings. So even if you're at the gate, you can still get a bottle of water. You can get a bite to eat. You can feel comfortable. Um, you can charge your phone, you can finish your report before you get on the plane, um, and your children can play in a custom-designed play area inspired by the air traffic control tower. Um, we also think, uh, again, tapping into the local culture and working with local artists and the local heritage, um, the architecture will not be imposing. We think the architecture can uh, receive and kind of encourage uh, uh, art installations throughout the building. So as an example, what this could look like, a custom art installation that is suspended from the ceiling, <coughs> again, to bring it some more unique character um, and uni unique life from Kansas City. Next slide. So then on arrivals, this is a view depicting what the baggage claim hall might look like. And so this is you're arriving into the city, you've come off your aircraft. Um, similar themes, you, you can see outside, you can see the landscape of the outside. So there's a kind of green natural setting around you. Uh, you can clearly see the cars at the pickup area. You can see the garage where you're going. And that water feature we described uh, in the check-in hall actually descends all the way from the roof all the way down to the baggage claim hall. So this also will be animated. You'll hear the sound of music. Um, it can be programmed like the illustrations we saw earlier. So to be very welcoming, a very calm space, um, and very clear as to where you're going. So that is some of our initial ideas, and we're putting them forward in this, uh, I think, in the can-do spirit uh, that is the, also an aspect of the heritage of this, of this city. Okay. Thank you, Councilman Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and let me say thank you to you all for your presentation today. Uh, but also, I want to sort of just back up uh, completely and start off with your initial comments of uh, the community meeting in which, which you all held over at the um, gym theater and um, you know what I what I think is important to point out is that the momentum is strong and is certainly growing um, when I spoke with the museum staff they shared that the uh, function was supposed to be held in just the blue room and then it went to the atrium and then uh, it went sort of somewhere else and they said well we need a bigger space and we need to go over to uh, the gym theater uh, and so I think that that is, of course, is a huge reflection uh, on, of course, the support that is generating from the airport um, and, of course, the many individuals and companies in our community who are, of course, wanting to grow their small business, uh, but then also wanting to be a part of this generational opportunity, which is before us. Um, the, to the renderings which bef uh, you all have sent us, I appreciate, of course, um, the attention to detail. Having served on the selection committee, I'll be the first to say that, yes, we saw many of these um, items that you all are presenting before us in a lot of the renderings and presentations, but this is your first shot. 
uh, at the renderings which you all are um, uh, showing us today, uh, which I think reflect the best of Kansas City. Councilman Lucas pointed out that he thought it was a picture of me and him in here somewhere <laughs> in one of our renderings. Uh, and I had to tell him I think they're just. Uh, Isn't that the best of Kansas City? <laughs> well, you can start a real argument. All 13 of us are the best in KC. That's right. <laughs> uh, so, no, I, um, I do appreciate, of course, you all uh, attempting to go above and beyond. And I think that. A course that, uh, yeah, that's the one I was talking about. That's kind of funny. Uh, but um, I think that, of course, uh, as we approach uh, November 7th, that this is the type of things that um, the community wants to see. And you all have continued to show, show yourself friendly throughout this process uh, and also very professional. And um, I, it excites me to, to see the 21st century fountains and the renderings that you all had before. So. Um, I don't know, and maybe I can dive a little deeper if I can, Mr. Mayor, by asking questions. Um, uh, sure, go ahead. The the design before us here um, does this still is this still in line with uh, what you all have presented in terms of the forty, excuse me, thirty five gates, uh, <coughs> the ability to expand, and if so, could you perhaps um, show a little bit, perhaps where the expansion uh, for future gates could possibly be and what that looks like or maybe dive a little deeper yeah th this represents uh, that that confirmed consensus scheme that emerged from the the, uh, the process leading up to I exhibit K in in all of the all of the aeronautical and and uh, air airline operational considerations um, the, the the possibilities for expansion are, are, are several um, right now, the, the what was in Exhibit K was a c extensions potentially of one or more of the of the concourses. Uh, we we want to be able to ensure that those expansions um, actually minimize future disruptions. So that's that's something that we are going to review uh, and confirm with the uh, in our discussions with the the aviation department and the and the airlines. And I'm no builder or anything along those lines, but w what you have in front of us would be at Terminal A, of course, which is what we're asking uh, for voters on the 7th. Could you perhaps walk through, I guess, uh, the, um, I guess, dynamics in terms of the space that is here? Is this all going to be how, how far in Terminal A in terms of size, scope, and scale of it, how far will that likely be? Uh, the the footprint of the of the the new terminal sits on virtually it covers basically the footprint of the of the terminal A site in, including the garage the the, the, a, the a garage to, to today so it's constrained um, outwardly by the cross taxiway system of of the of the airport and then on the on the near the tower by the other uh, operations buildings that are that are that are by the tower. So it it doesn't ex the 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 first the thirty seven thirty five thirty five doesn't does not um, uh, does not exceed the terminal A site, and so it'll have it'll have a very minimal if any impact on B operations uh, while it's while it's being constructed. Let me drill down a little further and ask you about finances. Mm -hmm. uh, is what we have before is still in line of what you all are proposing in terms of the dollar amount, or does um, the roof cost an extra million dollars or something? Um. Sure, um, I'll take that. So, you know, we put forward in our proposal a budget, and we are working towards um, maintaining that and not um, exceeding that. If issues come up as we further the design where there may be scope changes, then we'll have that conversation with the airport. Or if we have elements like the roof that perhaps add some money, then we'll find other places within the terminal to get it out because our goal is to, when we made a commitment on a budget, to stick to the budget that we put forward. Um, I'll let this be my last lightning round of questions. And of course, I'm <laughs> sure many of my colleagues have uh, comments that they would like to make or ask to, as well. The convenience factor. Uh, is, is the question I want to sort of ask. Um, and it's probably a twofold question in terms of does this, of course, keep the convenience that many of the citizens of our city actually enjoy? 
Uh, and then in terms of that convenience, uh, are you going to open up this sort of discussion in terms of allowing uh, for the design that you were putting forth before us uh, for citizens to maybe have input in terms of online sort of input or community meetings or things along, along that line? Because I think as it relates to the vote, uh, that's one of the things that I continue to hear. And, you know, we could say all day what we want about polls and data, uh, but folks really love the convenience of KCI. Uh, and I think that is one of the things that folks are uh, concerned about but wanting to uh, also know about. So could sure. you probably talk a little bit further about that? Yeah, I'll start and then maybe Derek or Peter can chime in as well. Uh, on the convenience factor, we, we think in this design uh, it'll be more convenient than it is today. And I say that because Kansas City is, for the top 50 largest cities in the country, the only airport that has arrivals and departures together. So that means all the traffic for arrival and departure is mixed. In our design, departures are um, on the upper level, arrivals are on the lower level, which means immediately 50 percent of the traffic is now split between two levels. So the convenience of drop-off or pickup should be improved. The proximity of the curb to the front of the terminal is the same, just like B and C, a garage literally across the roadway. As you see in the rendering, we have a garage just across um, the roadway. So in terms of convenience, uh, we think it'll be um, more convenient given the, the split in the traffic and the parking is just as close. On the community outreach, um, certainly, they all be posted, as I said, they're being posted online perhaps already uh, on our site and the city website. And then we will have those community design open house sessions here in the coming weeks to gather further input from um, all citizens who choose to attend so that we can incorporate their thoughts into uh, the design as we move it forward. If I can get one bonus question. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, sure. It's okay with me. <laughs> good, good, thank you. Um, <clears throat> our airline partners, have we uh, shown this? rendering to them? Have we worked with them? Is this something that they feel uh, still in line? Of course, Exhibit K, but then more importantly, of uh, uh, what it is that they certainly will need to run a uh, world-class airport. Yeah, as, as I, we've had, um, we've had four meetings, uh, and they've been represented in, in all of them. Um, and uh, we have, th this, the, what you see before you in terms of the actual layout and functional plan, does not change uh, Exhibit K. So all of that embedded functionality is in, is in these. These are basically taking that, that plan and lifting it up and trying to, to see what, what could that be in spatial terms for and experience terms for, for passengers. And if I could just add one element to the, to the convenience, what, when you're inside the building, most things will be more conveniently accessible than they are today because of the compartmentation of the of the of the existing of the existing terminals. So there'll be a, a layer of a level of convenience that's that's enhanced. Yeah. Well, that's my five minutes. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Councilwoman Lore. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of my questions got answered here, but I have a couple of still <coughs> pending. Um, we're talking about convenience, which of course is why people love KCI. Uh, <coughs> coming from um, the, say the entrance of the terminal, going all the way back and all the way to the end of the gate, what kind of distance are we talking about there? Um, the, the, uh, the overall distances, I mean, right now you have a lot of, a lot of side to side uh, motion right. in, in 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 the gates. the The closest gates, um, the closest gates will be perhaps a hundred steps uh, greater than 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 what you have today in in uh, in B. So and the furthest. Uh, yeah. Th so the so the furthest will be about about fifty percent longer than than the lo than the than the longest of the of the gates of the gates today. So, we're so, so I mean, there, there's, sorry? We're talking quite a ways, quite a difference in what we have now compared to what you're showing us here. There'll be, there'll be some, there'll be some difference given the increased size of aircraft that, that the airlines, that the airlines need to. You, you need also to have movable run. walkway, this corridor for here. Yeah. So from here to here is 800 feet and you'll have two movable walkways. So you'll be able to jump a movable walkway from say right here and walk, um, through the half and about halfway, you can you can bounce out and then j continue on um, to the outer to the outer concourse, so double loaded. How so how long are these? The how wide are the concourses there uh, from end to end? Yeah. So so the the current 
arc of a of a one of the existing terminals at at um, at at the airport today is is over 2,500 feet in length. Right. I know what we each, have now. Okay. What sorry. We, what are you doing? Yeah. E- each of these are about 1,200 in that in that. 1,200. Those two are end to end. Yeah. Okay. And 800 feet in the middle. Correct. It's it's about at, at its it's about uh, it's about 600 of 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 uh, of just walkway. And otherwise, they're the con- and how wide concession is the, notes. the terminal when you walk into it. How wide is that from that to to where you get to the to the first concourse? So the first concourse, it's it's about it's about 150 feet. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's my only question at this point. Thank you, Councilman Lucas. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, gentlemen, uh, for being here today. Uh, I commend you on these renderings. Uh, I know there's been some conversation about when we'd get them, and I think everybody in the community and the flying public is interested in it. I would also recommend this for anyone who's um, interested in seeing the work of this uh, firm, Edgemore. Um, uh, over at the University of Kansas, there's a significant project that you're all working on. I will still take a tour of it at some point, but I, I drive by it with some frequency, and you're doing fine work over there, so we look forward to that here. Um, My question and area of interest is probably most for Mr. Uh, Stricker. Uh, There's been conversation throughout this project as to how this can be a transformative project um, for the community, being all parts of the community. And there has been some discussion of uh, both community benefits agreements and uh, representation goals for uh, minorities and women. Could you speak first to the outreach you've done since... uh, uh, being notified you're the victors uh, in this, and then also uh, where you stand now in terms of uh, either uh, minority representation, uh, woman-owned business representation, workforce representation, but then also community benefit programs that you have uh, set for the project. Uh, sure, I'm happy to, happy to address those. Um, so in the last month or so, give or take, it's <coughs> close to a month now since we uh, got the recommendation from the selection committee. As I said, we've probably met two dozen groups. Uh, that would include uh, several minority uh, uh, construction, the Minority Contractors Association, Hispanic Contractors. Um, we met with uh, Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So several minority um, representative groups uh, have very positive conversations with them. Um, as Councilman Reed uh, referenced earlier, the outreach event we held a couple of weeks ago and one we're planning to hold here in, in another week or so. Uh, so we've had very positive reception relative to our outreach plans. Uh, we are, as I mentioned earlier, in the process now of interviewing and filling out the team. We are have not made selections yet to bring folks on board because we're still in the midst of the interview process, but that should be happening here in the next 30 days or so. We know the commitments we made in our proposal, what was in the ordinance, uh, and we are very committed to meeting or exceeding each and every one of those goals that is laid out in the Community Benefits Agreement. Uh, For us, it's the right thing to do. It's something that from each of the companies on our team, the um, impact and having a positive impact in the communities where we live, work, and play is part of our cultures. Uh, It's part of why we work well together. And so all the items um, in the Community Benefits Agreement, as I mentioned earlier, whether it's around transportation, healthcare, nursing, the financial services that we've offered like prompt pay or pay without delay for minority small women-owned businesses, uh, help with bonding, all that is in process. All those elements are reflected in the MOU that we're working on, and um, we're excited to get uh, to make get those commitments crystallized so that we can then move forward and execute on the plan. Um, we had in our proposal, as I believe you're aware, commitments for MB and WB um, um, participation goals, uh, both on the construction and the professional services side. Um, the RFQP did not have workforce requirements. We know what the standard city requirements are, but we are working through that now to come up with, based on our analysis of the market, what we think is an appropriate target for both minority and women-owned workforce participation. When we get to that number, what we do to ensure that we have it, because some people say a goal is a goal, and if I don't get there, at least I tried. For us, that's failure. Uh, For us, we put into all of our subcontracts that Edgemore will have with the design build team, the design build team will then have with their lower tier folks um, mandates that if they don't hit those goals, they get penalized. 
Uh, so therefore, they are incented, of course, to make sure that the goal is not a goal, but the goal is a requirement. And so we will have that through all our contracts from Edgemore down uh, throughout the chain. Okay. Thank you. Um, <coughs> still for you, Mr. Stricker. Um, in terms of outreach to, to local businesses sure. on, on this project, so not necessarily minority or women-owned, but other local businesses both in Kansas City, Missouri, um, and focus on regional, what are you doing to ensure an adequate representation of local uh, construction and other services, businesses from actually professional services connected to the sure. project, construction, and so on? Um, so in the MOU, first and foremost, there's a local hire preference. So that will be factoring into our decision as we bring firms on board, uh, number one. Number two, uh, I'll go back to the KU project that you referenced a moment ago. With that project, 94% um, of the companies are local and 98% of the workforce was local. Uh, and so for us, it's very important and we recognize that um, projects are built locally, all of, um, and so it is very important to us to engage the local workforce um, and businesses as much as possible, MB, WB, but even the larger ones as well. And so that is our first um, line of, I'll say defense, perhaps it's the wrong choice of words, but the first line where we go for businesses and if we are unable to fill certain tiers or trades, then we'll look further out. But our first, our first uh, sort of pool is local. Understood. Thank you. Um, a question actually for Mr. Klein. Uh, when we talk about the, the transformational nature of this, we, we consider in that the fact that there might be an opportunity for more employment, right? We assume that uh, retail, other kind of services at the airport will increase, and I believe our studies uh, to help us fund some of this uh, contemplates a 50% a or so increase in uh, spending at the airport. Uh, is that correct? The, well, yeah, we, we, didn't, we didn't raise prices. We anticipate that um, the retail sales that we have will probably at least double, just, just be the sheer fact that everybody's walking by them now instead mm -hmm. of the, the way we have it set up now. So, yes. So what is the city or your department in particular doing to ensure that some of the same workforce uh, issues that we're thinking about with the construction will be things that are seen um, on this project in the long term? Um, minority representation to the extent we can, opportunities for local businesses and others. So, so right now we have basically two contracts with host and parities, um, of which they, there's some joint ventures. Um, we, we will bid out all of those contracts again. Um, we will push towards uh, joint ventures that have local flavor to them. So um, as, we, as we go through it and we determine what, you know, what we need and where we need it, um, those joint ventures will come and we will push for um, the local aspects so it's not a chain from, from, from a nationwide. It, it, folks know that this is Kansas City and that, and that, that ability is there. So it will have the local flavor and the local participation in those joint ventures if, if, if the companies can't do it alone. They can always team up with the uh, joint venture and HOY company, a parodies or a host or that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, just to add to that, um, in, uh, my colleague Kwaku talked about this at the outreach event. One of the things that we've done in the past and we're happy to do here is when we have job fairs and people will sign up for their interest, <gasps> we can also ask them, are you interested in other opportunities beyond construction post-completion? And for the LA Forum project that uh, the construction company built, after the completion of that building, they were able to give to the owner a list of 500 names of folks who had said, I'm also interested in some type of retail or other job at the forum beyond construction. And so therefore, th in that case, the owner had, in essence, a beginning list of folks who were interested in additional work at beyond construction. Mm -hmm. And we're happy to help the aviation department with that as well. And we will, I mean, it'll be similar to what we did at the East Patrol. If you remember at the East Patrol project, there was the, the job trailer that Gigi had. Um, where folks could come in that were just looking for a job and then they weren't necessarily looking for construction jobs on that deal, but there were over, I think over 140 people that she placed in other jobs around the city. She knew when there was OSHA training and other, other types of training, which would allow um, um, us to generate a list of, of folks who were looking for jobs and then place them in, in places where their skill sets allow. Mm -hmm. um, and then my final uh, area of inquiry relates to public transportation and how it works with the airport. Um, you know, in this uh, rendering, I guess uh, there are some, and if we had the money for it, I'd love it too, have a long-term dream of some sort of fixed rail to the airport and that sort of thing. Is there any actual space for this and how this design is drawn out? Or that's question one, and maybe the answer is no, and that's fine. Question two, however, is 
uh, for public transit. I imagine city buses will still go. We'll still have employees, Kansas Cityans that need to get to the airport, hopefully efficiently. Uh, and, and where is that kind of in, in how this project works? So, so I'll, I'll get that real quick. Um, the design's not far enough along that we've, we've pushed in a light rail kind of uh, area. I've got plenty of right of way on our as, as we're coming in through Cookingham um, mm -hmm. to get the light rail into the into the airport, and then it would just be through the function of the design process to kind of reserve some green space or something that would allow um, a construction of that to, to get into the either the parking garage or the facility. Um, buses, taxiways, limos, TNCs. Um, the, you, we mentioned the top roadway coming in, the, the bottom roadway coming in, the arrivals. What we didn't mention was you'll have, there'll be a split-off roadway that'll take you into the parking garage, and the commercial vehicles will go into the parking garages. So the, 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 the busing system will, for, for our economy lots will be uh, in there. The busing um, for the rental car facilities will be in there, and it'll all be point-to-point -point instead of you know circling around um, the current terminals we've got. And then if, if you're one of the first ones on the bus, great, but if you were the last one and the bus is full, you got to wait for the next bus. So this will all be point to point. You wait till the bus is full and then they go. Um, so, it, but it's all through the parking garage at the lower levels when you come in. Mm -hmm. right, right at the front, right at the front of the uh, parking garage. So just across the streets. We'll have a taxi line queue, um, probably be in the parking garage. So it'll eliminate the queue system that we have out by the towers now and the problems associated with that. So it'll allow for a lot more centralization of those kind of issues. Mm -hmm. Do we still contemplate satellite parking for employees and then they're bused into what would be the main terminal now? Or? What we have is we are planning on keeping the B garage. Um, the employees will be able to come into that uh, uh, B garage, park in there, and then walk into the facility um, through a, um, some sort of space that's conditioned. And uh, we've got about a $2 million savings between gas and the contract right. for that for that 24-7 uh, satellite parking for the employees. So it's a big operational savings to keep the B garage and let that for our employees parking. And we could, we could, we could technically do our uh, valet service there for overflow if we wanted to, depending on if we needed it for the garage. All right. Thank you. Councilwoman Hall. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your presentation and your time um, and for being here. I do have nine questions and a comment. So my comment is, not only did you do something at KU, but you also did something at K-State. So if you're really going to play. Yes. <laughs> so thank you. The innovation campus at the Olathe um, campus is very nice. So um, you have local ties to both schools so far that have been represented here today. Um, this is, does look very nice. I appreciate the renderings. It helps get a visual in our heads about what you're talking about. Um, the, you mentioned the cost of, of what there's, and I'm not going to re-ask questions my colleagues have asked, but um, what I haven't heard is what the maintenance on this looks like. Um, we seem to have a problem keeping things well maintained at KCI, and we already say we're spending $500 million a year <coughs> ma maintaining what we're doing. What will the maintenance of this be, and can we afford that based on what you do? It looks pretty is great, but if I can't afford to keep it after you've built it, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll start at least from the, the design perspective um, and how we are trying to or will address that issue. So part of what we do as developers is, and sorry, I'm, I don't mean to turn my back to the folks on this side of the, of the dais up here. Part of what we do as developers is we think about operating costs. Now, when we deliver the terminal, the aviation department is going to continue to operate it. Having said that, it's important to us to think about what are those long-term costs and then incorporate that into the design up front so that we can have lower costs. Um, and so part of our design challenge here over the next several months is to say, you know, when we pick a material or a system, what is the 40-year cost of that material or system, not what is the cost on day one? Because often decisions are made to be low on day one, and then they have very significant maintenance costs over 30 or 40 years. And so we will do that uh, analysis of comparing systems and what we call whole life costs, um, what those are, in essence, to drive down the operating costs <coughs> of our client, the aviation department in the city, throughout the process. Some of the things we'll do on the sustainability front will help drive down energy costs. The natural light that you saw will mean lights, for the most part, um, don't need to be on during the day, so there'll be significant energy savings, but we'll focus on that from a sustainability to help drive down uh, costs. I don't believe we are far enough along, and, and Pat chime in here, that they've done a model yet of what the operating costs will be for the new terminal. Um, but there will be, we believe there will be significant efficiencies from the design and then the operations. So let me give you an example. He, he's exactly right. Let me give you an example. Right now we have custodial um, workers that work for the, um, our, our department 
um, the, they do the pre-security stuff, and the airlines have a contract with a custodial company that does each hold room. So um, American, Southwest, they have their own contract. Through this process, since it will be um, common use, um, our workers will be able to handle all of the, uh, of the deal. So there will be a savings, um, whether it's to us or to the airlines, of not needing two workforces to handle to handle that th those facilities. So um, I anticipate those those kind of savings um, throughout different um, items in in our in our operations, our maintenance um, to, to that will you know refine and, and make the building more efficient and our, our, our operations more efficient. Um, one thing uh, you mentioned about you said 500 million for maintenance. Um, we don't spend that annually. Right now we spend between 20 and 26 percent on operations and maintenance. Uh, um, out of our operating revenues a year, um, so it's not. Uh, I'm not sure what the number was, but um, um, so it's 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 between 20 and 20, 26 percent roughly. A little over 20 million, a little over 20 million. And as our revenues have went up, so uh, our revenues may have been 80 million dollars in total, say 10 years ago, and now they're 150. That percentage goes up with it. So it's. Um, you, you, it's not a fixed amount. It's a bit's based on a percentage, and, and and that's how it's calculated. So then, from what I understand, then we are going to reduce our amount of employees. No, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. Uh, we may. We shouldn't have to reduce our employees. For instance, we'll get rid of the red buses, but then we'll have the ability to have um, those folks picked up through our, our blue bus operations. Um, haven't gotten far enough in along that I, I don't. I don't see us reducing employees through this. I don't think there'll be that much of efficiencies where you know it, it'll cost us jobs. Um, but if you're driving a red bus now, you may be driving a blue bus later instead of a red bus. That's not what I'm talking about. You mentioned you had two teams of custodial work on the inside and the outside, and now you have to you can eliminate one of them. The, the airlines probably wouldn't do the contract in that in in the custodial example, right? But it still reduces the amount of people who are working at the airport. It yes, it, okay. it, yes, That's there would be an efficiency there, right? So the efficiency is people will some people will lose their job. So some of the contracts that are currently done won't, won't be there. Right? That's just what I wanted to make sure I understood. Okay. Yep. And then to your point, um, my colleague asked about vendors and how they um, would rebid on their contracts um, out there. Um, that's always been a sticking point with so many people is we don't have enough amenities at KCI. That is not the big picture that we're talking about today. However, um, I do want to make sure that we are making a concerted effort to get local flavor, local people, local businesses in there, not just parodies and whoever else you mentioned, just two local Local people. I don't even know if they're local or not, but um, I want to make sure that we have the opportunity to to be what we're asking. Absolutely. What we say we want to be by offering that opportunity to local people to have their businesses there or have their products for sale there or have a whatever. Yeah, that? That, that is the plan, yes. Okay, and now that you have been selected, and if this passes in November, uh, I will say to you what I've said to everybody before you, stop promoting the pigs and the cows and the green things in Kansas City. We are a lot more than that, and that cannot possibly be the only thing we have to offer when people walk off the airplane and see that in Kansas City. Uh, we have actually have been thinking about we 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 titled the, the the restaurant in one of those images uh, Beyond Barbecue, new, new KC Cuisine. Yeah. <laughs> well, we don't want to let go. And that's the other thing. Please don't forget about our past. We are the stockyards. Past, we have these present, really great future. things. We're not getting rid of barbecue just because we want to make right. this some new fancy city. We're still a barbecue city, and don't forget that. Absolutely. Please. Uh, um, the, the last thing I would say about um, the uh, the – the vendor thing, too, is is when you do do the marketing of it. I guess, I'm sorry, somebody interrupted me. I, I lost my train of thought. I'll come back to that. Um, my third question is on the community design meetings. You mentioned that you'll be having those. Do we, as the council people in those districts, get to help you set those meeting ups, uh, meetings up, organize them, and plan them, or do you do those on your own and we're just notified of them, or how does that work? We absolutely want input from each council member here on locations um, where it could happen, dates that are appropriate, et cetera. So, yeah, we will coordinate with each office to get that set up. So you'll coordinate. Okay. Yes. Because there's nothing worse than double booking. We're always double booked. So let us know what your we want are so we can be Exactly. And we, we clearly want robust attendance. The worst thing for us is we have a meeting and five people show up. So we'd rather have 100. So. We don't. Yeah, nobody has time <laughs> to have a five-person meeting. Right Understood. Now. You have a lot on your schedules. Um, 
Okay, you mentioned that you're doing all this at A, and most all of the construction will be at A. However, you just now mentioned that B will continue to be parking for the staff. Um, who pays for the demolition of B and C, and is that part of the budget of the overall, and do you all handle that, or is that something different? Does that fall into another budget? So, you know, so the, the program budget, the 964, covers demolition of a, a parking garage and A terminal, and it covers the demolition of parking garage B terminal. Um, Dave Long in our office has threatened a GoFundMe page to try to tear down C because he'd like that included in that budget. So um, as we go through this, there'll be pressure from our staff to not to leave uh, Terminal C when it's all, when everything's all said and done. So it's it's cleared um, just because the operations and the maintenance of, the, of that facility for an empty building, um, the, 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 we will have to talk through those conversations. But the program budget now, the 964, the, the billion dollars we've talked about is Terminal A garage and Terminal and B. Uh, B terminal. Let me jump in. So the, the 964, the, the, as Pat mentioned, is everything. <laughs> Cradle to it's soup to nuts. It's um, it's everything for roadways. It's all of built into that um, uh, development process. So it's everything on the site B, uh, terminal A, as well as the demolition of okay. <coughs> as well as the roadway configuration, all new utilities completions, it, all that infrastructure associated is all built into that 964 million. I want to I want to go back on the one of the big efficiencies that we're going to get from a long-term operating standpoint, and it was the one re a very compelling reason why the Edgemore proposal stuck out on the evaluation team, was they were the only team that offered what they call a, a living building or a net zero approach to from a sustainability standpoint. So from a long-term energy, and energy costs are a huge um, expenditure of resources. It doesn't affect jobs or anything. It's a whole lot of you're spending money heating, cooling, right. providing water, all of those types of issues. So one of the approaches that Edgemore was, I found most appealing was the fact that they were the only firm that said, we think we can do this as a net zero or a net positive uh, structure, which means that its carbon footprint is essentially zero. It's, it saves as much energy as it consumes or actually generates more net energy when you think about offsetting the cost of people getting to the terminal. So that has long-term operating savings separate from who cleans what and do, does what. Okay. Those are issues that will have the, mag the potential to save us tens of millions of dollars over the term. Our, our electric bill this year is $12, 12 million. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's big dollars. I'd like to, when, as we go future and deeper into this, once you have your plans more formulated, I'd like you to show us some numbers of what the future looks like. If you say when you plan what you're, when you budget, you budget for not today but for a 40-year lifespan, we, can you do that information and put that with that plan about what kinds of efficiencies we should see over the 40-year plan? Yeah, we're happy to share the analysis that would show the cost of, uh, a, you know, a chiller, a boiler, whatever the system is, mm -hmm. Um, over what a 40 year life, what the initial cost is, what the maintenance costs are, and then what the net present value of that is. And that's how we do the analysis to say which is the lowest net present value for a particular system, a finish, et cetera. And we'd be happy to share that analysis. Well, my colleague, Councilman Wagner, and I were at a breakfast this morning, and our North uh, Kansas City School District is partnering with Kansas City on CNG buses. And just the, ma the magnitude of what they're doing because of that, the savings is extraordinary over the next several years. So that would be really nice to be able to show the number of the 12 million versus what we're looking for. Um, okay, my, my brain came back on my question, too. The last thing I wanted to say was when you're doing those um, efficiencies and you're saying that how pretty this is with the, the water feature, and I love that you're incorporating that we are the city of fountains, and I love that, but from a financial perspective and a maintenance long-term perspective, how much does something like that cost? And as you're building it into the budget, um, you know, just... How do we make that work, you know, and, and are you planning for all that? Because, I, again, I go back to that looks really pretty on paper, um, but is that, a, is that something we can sustain long term? Um, let me handle that. Um, so we've been working through these drawings for about three weeks, and Jeff and Derek can attest, as soon as they showed us the water feature, some of our operation maintenance folks were like, what does that do for noise levels in the, in the terminal? Yeah. What does that do for humidity into the terminal? You know, are, are, are nuts and bolts going to corrode, that sort of thing? All of the maintenance-wise, which will all have to be studied before we agree to say, okay, we're going to put a two-story water feature inside the building that <coughs> works that way. So um, the, 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 slut, the slats in the roof, um, you know, 
what does snow on top of that do? And the last thing you want is it sliding off onto a person or a car off the top of the roof. So our people were like, how do you clean the windows? So um, mm -hmm. we're looking at the operations and the maintenance of it as we go through this to make sure that we have a clear understanding of not building something that, it, you know, as soon as they throw us the keys, we're like, okay, now our maintenance just tripled because, you know, we, we, had, to, we had to build something really nice. It has to work at both function and feature because I mean we can all, all day long say absolutely it is. nobody's questioning your your design and your ability to be creative and make it look nice so thank you for that okay number five security gates uh, yes. my colleague was asking you about the different concourses um, are you having one one major security that everybody funnels through that goes to everything or are there going to be multiple security locations where people can say okay if we're going to gates 1 through 20 you go through this security gates 20 through 35 or whatever go to this one how does that work Right now, the exhibit K shows a single secur security screening ch checkpoint. And you're keeping it like that? Uh, that that we're about to, to start a what we call the program validation period, where we go through all of the all of the the forecasting and the planning buildup that has led to exhibit K, so that we could completely own it. And we anticipate that there may be some elements within the the general arrangement of the of the building that that we might do further studies for. It's one twelve right now. The the exhibit K process had one twelve lane security, so that that that'll be looked at as through this through the validation. Okay. Um, parking. Uh, how many spaces do we have now, and will we have more or less? Uh, we will have more. Um, we have roughly. 4,200 spaces uh, in the B and C parking garage, and we have about 700 to 1,000 valet parkers overnight. So the valet's been largely successful. We did, we did not anticipate that at all. Um, I do not remember the amount of uh, circle of surface that you walk up to, uh, but I know that it was roughly in the 2,000 to 4,000, and there were there were more part there was more surface parking than there previously was. Um, the parking garage here that's shown is 6,500 spaces. So it's 1,500 spaces, kind of on a minimum, more than we have the, currently in our two in our three parking garages. You think that sounds like a right number? For well, you? it'll it'll be uh, the the validations for all of it. Um, one of the things we're gonna have to do is like the 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 square footage for ticket counters. All of that um, for all the square footages through the whole building will have to be validated from the exhibit K process because we did this in 2015 and 16 to make sure one did we not miss anything and then two are those square footages right because if they can be shrunk because we're going to have less ticket counters because we have more of the stand up kiosks for self service then then that's help then that that'll be helpful for this for shrinking the building and making it more efficient but we haven't gotten completely to that yet in our validation process so question seven yep. um, that leads to my timeline so you're mentioning this validation process for a few of the things I've asked how long does that validation process take and when do you say yeah it's <coughs> completed and then what does that do to the overall timeline of the project should this pass in November That's exactly what I asked Tuesday Derek yeah so we're, we're <laughs> oh, so I'm not you're, in, you're in good hands with that here. Um, you got my notes <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we, we're overlapping. We're overlapping the concept design process with the with the validation because because the general footprint, it, it, we know roughly the size of it. We can start with things like the building envelope, the roof, and those kinds of studies, and go through the interior finishes before we know where everything's gonna be. We can we can do the life cycle cost analyses for different things. So that'll start. In, that has started, um, and the validation process will sync up with with the concept design process so we don't anticipate any any uh, change to the to the overall schedule okay and then you, I assume at some point you will give us an overall timeline and schedule yeah I mean we had a, a schedule as part of our proposal that had us um, getting through the design the contract negotiations and envir environmental process um, by end of May early June next year and starting construction next summer uh, given that it took a little bit longer to make the selection versus what we have, we'll try and make up that month or so, but that's kind of roughly the time frame that we're targeting. Okay. Um, so. And I should add that their projected opening date is the end of 2022. So 21. Planning, 21. Excuse me, 2021, right, 2021. 2021. Thank you. Um, Okay, oh, you're lucky. 20, number eight, I wasn't actually a question. I was just writing down the percentage of your steps, and you mentioned that, 88. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but I do have one more, so I really had 10. But okay, <laughs> number nine is um, you mentioned having district meetings in District 3 and District 5. That you've already had one in three, you're going to have one in five. Are you planning on doing district meetings separate from your community <laughs> design meetings to meet with the districts, like District 1 and 2, since we're the ones who it's basically in our backyard? What, what's your plan on that? Um, so we've had a couple of meetings already with uh, the chamber, the Northland Chamber in Platte County EDC, and have been invited to several of their events. But we will ha we are happy to have events that are um, design specific, as I mentioned earlier, but just general update meetings at any time with any council member if they ask us to. Okay. Well, you're invited to Northland Neighborhoods. We meet the uh, second Tuesday morning of every month at NNI, and it's um, first district problem solving. And we welcome you to be there. 9:30 in the morning. I'll give you an invitation. Wonderful. We'd love to attend. I know we'd like you to be there. Um, okay, so my tenth question, which now really is... You nine. only had nine. <laughs> 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 but number eight was actually her, so You've I... actually had 15. Um, I'll do like my colleague did, my bonus question, and that is... <laughs> oh, no. Police and the security system, does that change what you do? Do we still have airport police? Will we work with the Kansas City, Missouri Police Department? Does that change our relationship with them or require anything more of them no. or not? No. What happens? Right now there's no projected change. Okay. And you feel like because there's one terminal instead of three terminals, your security will be better, more efficient? Will you eliminate some of those positions? What, what's that going to look like? I mean, we're, oh, we're not to that level yet. Um, um, I have a turnover issue. Um, the KCI patrol officers, you ask them, they're, they're underpaid. Um, so we frequently lose them in the first year after they get their, after they get their training uh, and everything complete. Um, we've done some things HR-wise to bump those up, but um, we frequently run uh, as, you know, open, open HR things for those. So I don't know that we will lose folks. Um, it'll just be how many we need to make sure that we have to keep the facility uh, um, at, the, uh, at the operational status that people expect. Yeah, we do expect to be safe when right. we get here. Absolutely. And, and I would say we're, the, the plan is that Terminal A will be under construction. Terminal B and C will remain in right. fully operational until the end, so there won't be any change. It will take a, when it relates to public safety, it will take a, a higher degree of coordination. Uh, with, uh, and that's one of the advantages of why we put North Patrol on, on the KCI site is it helps us allow us to create some improved synergies from a response issue. As Pat mentioned, uh, we're, we, we're going to be reliant on KCI, uh, KC, KCPD um, as part of our overall um, infrastructure uh, planning and, and development. So uh, this, is a, this will be a good opportunity over the next three or four years to kind of coordinate, tie in, look at different arrangements. Again, that's And they, they do meet they do. they do meet regularly to uh, to coordinate issues and stuff. So, I mean, there is some pr there is pretty good coordination between the new um, op the new major up there and uh, and our folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Along with Platte County Sheriff too, right? Okay. Thank you. I'm Bonus ready. round is over. Look at that. I finished. Thank you for your patience. Councilman Barnes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, my first line of questioning was was kind of taken care of by um, colleague uh, Lucas there, uh, having to do with the community benefits agreements and um, how you plan to approach the community in terms of what you plan to do. Um, because as as one who actually took a deep dive into reading actually reading the proposals, yours I, and I and I you know I've mentioned this on several occasions, yours is pretty lacking in terms of uh, what you actually offered and with the uh, to the extent that we as a council um, took it upon ourselves to put things in um, the offer things in the MOU that we hope that you will agree to uh, and if and if you can not agree to some of those things um, uh, it's going to be extremely difficult for me to think about moving forward with you as the uh, as the developer that's number one uh, second, um, have you, as an organization or a collective team of organizations, uh, designed, built, and financed an, an airport from what we call the, from the dirt? Um, so, yes is the answer. Let me go back to your first your first comment, which is every item that's in the ordinance is the MOU, and every item that is in that part of the contract, we are 
accepting as they're written. So everything that's in the ordinance is fine by us and we're not pushing back on any of that. Um, in the answer to the specific question of design, build, finance, <coughs> our partner, uh, Meridium, who's on our team, is the developer of the LaGuardia Terminal, which is a design, build, finance, and even operate and maintain uh, facility. And so, uh, and in that, they also have all the responsibility and operations and maintenance for the retail leasing, et cetera. So we bring that expertise as part of our team to what we offer to Kansas City is what, what they're doing currently with LaGuardia. Uh, uh, the last uh, line of question has to do with um, one of the things that made your um, supposedly made your proposal uh, better in the eyes of those in, on the selection committee was the fact that you were going to uh, possibly do debt only financing as you deal uh, delve more into how uh, this thing is going to be done built and, and actually financed are you still looking at being able to uh, do a debt only financing structure for the airport so uh, you're correct, we did propose debt only as a possibility. It's still on the table. There are some issues we need to explore with the FAA relative to how that gets implemented with the community benefits. Um, uh, so we need to run that to ground. The community benefits have very little to do with how what happens at the airport. Uh, community benefit agreements generally are, are done and, and developed between the developer and with the developer's dollars and the, the city. So it has nothing to do with how the airport is financed, how the airport is operated. So, I mean, let's, we're not, we should not get into that kind of conversation. Well, in our view, as uh, folks on the selection committee know, and as we've said before, is we, Edgemore, are not a, an infrastructure fund. So that's part of the reason we put forward a debt only solution. And uh, we are more than happy to execute on that solution uh, for Kansas City and the airport. Okay. Councilman Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, only one question for me. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Lord. Ten parts. <laughs> we, we try, but not <laughs> even in ten parts. And a bonus. Not even in ten parts. Um, just really one of expectation as far as the uh, community meetings that you expect to have in November and December, having <coughs> a successful <coughs> vote. Um, because putting a design is sort of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, people want to know what the thing's going to look like, and on the other hand, they think once you put a drawing out there, that's what it's going to be. And so I'd like a better understanding of what your expectations are as far as these meetings in November and December. So, y you know, is it uh, you can come out of there and see a wildly different design, or is it a matter of, hey, you get uh, a better understanding of um, the seats, the amenities package, those sorts of things. So just just for those who may be watching and then hearing that, hey, I may have an opportunity uh, to have some impact on what this looks like, give them some expectation of the sorts of things that you might be looking for and what they can expect uh, their feedback to, to utilize. Sure, I'll start and Derek or Peter may jump in as well. So we have a lot of experience doing these type of design open house meetings, as, as I've called them, for um, the Long Beach Civic Center project that we're doing now that's currently under construction with SOM as the designer. We had over 100 meetings in the community of Long Beach, and those meetings tended to take the design as we have it now or on that project had it at that point in time, and then seek feedback from the community on one, as Derek mentioned, aesthetics, functionality, et cetera, but then also often we have, and it's as simple as to give people a couple of green dots and say, you know, put it by convenience, put it by amenities, put it by sustainability, to see the elements that are important to the community so that as we go back and gather that feedback, we then make sure that if it's convenience or sustainability or whatever the items are, that we make sure we hit those out of the park because that's what the constituents say is the most important elements to them. It's typically not where we are Today, typically not our plan to show up with four designs and say, you know, pick A, B, C, or D. Uh, we're very proud of the design we have here, and we're looking for comments to continue this down the path, recognizing this is not this is not fixed in stone, and we we will get feedback. And I'm sure if we come back to you in December, or January, or February, you'll see something similar, but there'll be some some new elements to it. No, uh, uh, these are put only part. Uh, oh, <laughs> good. No, no, that, that that's good. Uh, it's fine. Uh, you, you know, we've put these forward as design principles. I think you know the first part of the meeting may be a, a, a little bit of information and exp explanation of, 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 of what what's what the the, the functionality of, of exhibit K is and the starting point for, for the work but but otherwise we'll open it open open it up. It'll be structured but open. Let's call it that. Thank you, Mr. 
Councilman McManus. Thank you. Um, just a couple questions. The um, I think the design is stunning. I think it it says a lot just by having a picture in front of us. Um, I in particular appreciate the attention to sustainability and that use of light, natural light, not just from the cost effectiveness and operation that we've already talked about, but just also just from the aesthetics. Here's my specific question is, is SOM does airports all over the world. If I haven't been to Madagascar, if I go there, is it going to look like this? Is this unique? And tell me a little bit about what makes it unique from your experience because it's worldwide. Yeah. I, uh, you know, if you, we have terminals in, I may have mentioned in Singapore and Hong Kong and Mumbai that Peter and I designed together. Um, I, I think we, we, we have a, a way to travel yet in, in terms of, of, uh, of, of finding something that, that is fully expressive and that people will, will really um, be able to relate to. We've had um, this period of, of excellent interaction. We have uh, members of our team, our design team, who are born and raised and have prof had professional lives uh, here. Um, but I'll be the first to say it's a, it's a process of, of discovery and invention uh, uh, through this, that that we we have a, we have a, a ways to travel, and and I believe that that we will um, end up with something that 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 uh, you can relate to. But I, I think the, the the direct answer to your question is: if you went to Mumbai or Singapore, it's not you're not going to see the same roof. You're not you, you know you may see the same flooring, right. but this is we spent our time to start from scratch, take what the aviation department had put together in Exhibit K, and say. Okay, they have a great running start. What can we do to embellish that and make it unique and special? And, and so that's what we've tried to do here today. Well, and I appreciate the recognition that this is a starting point and that, you know, it's not the end point. And like you said, there's going to be a community discussion around that. Um, here's a second question. The FAA, you mentioned you're talking to them in 10 days. What role is that conversation play into design, if at all, or what is the purpose of that? Uh, just it's in Pat chime in here in a moment, but it's uh, you know the first of what would be a series of meetings. Obviously, the FAA is going to be an important stakeholder in the process, and so it's an opportunity for our team to meet the local regional FAA office and begin the dialogue of how we're moving forward on the project and, and the issues and where they need to be an integral stakeholder in the process. And the key, big key for them is get them on board early and find out do they have any issues, and if they are, what are they, and then as 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 a group work through them. Um, along with just making the, the introductions and that sort of thing. So it's a recognition that they're part of the, 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 the they have a role, I guess, obviously, in, sure. to play in, in this. TSA and uh, Customs and Border Patrol, all of, yeah, all of it. So another aspect that kind of creates a dynamic, fluid aspect to the, the design. The FAA is important because of the passenger facility charges and any uh, AIP um, grants we want to use. And then, of course, we will push them to see, you know, we've got a lot of um, apron space. Is there anything else that can... Uh, grants wise or stuff that we can um, mm. look for look for to try to make that uh, funding package better so here's my last question is that uh, this might be the hardest but uh, it's kind of the predicament we're in and and selling this to the public and giving them specificity that they probably want and desire but also recognizing that it's a fluid process and the public is actually going to weigh in quite a bit if this passes um, as well as other stakeholders so what what beyond pictures will we be able to provide the public in terms of data points on specific parameters of what this is going to look in terms of your four elements, which are convenience, amenities, sustainability, and that key C focus? And I don't necessarily mean, you know, I don't need to know the millimeters to the bathroom, but but like what will we be able to provide them any bullet points because I've heard some today that frankly are really helpful for me and I guess I'd like to be able to simulate those and be able to communicate those in a way that makes sense and under each one of these four elements to be able to tell them the benefits that that would be acquired by passing this in November and I hope that's something you're you're working through and I assume that's a, again a kind of a dynamic process but it seems to me that that's probably the next step. Yeah, and we can certainly provide I mean, it, the sort of the core of that question is what's the detailed program, right? So if we say there's retail, well, is it 1,000 square feet or 10,000 or 50,000? Is there one bathroom, two bathrooms, or 10 bathrooms, right? Things like that. So we can certainly provide that uh, so people get a sense of what the program is. I would also say what, I mean, from the citizen's point of view, what amenities have you seen that you like? That you'd like to see that we may not have here. What technologies have you seen at other airports? You know, why, for instance, one of the things I gave I gave him a whole list of things. Um, uh, the wireless charging now is a deal. 
you know, is there a table that we can have that you don't need to plug in the cords? Maybe you should just fit, sit your phone down and it wirelessly, wirelessly charges while it's there so you don't need the electric plug-ins. So there, what, what sustainability is there? You know, do we want a solar roof on the parking garage or do we want solar out in the area that will minimize the, the green spaces? Those kind of uh, questions that, you know, we'll get a lot of that kind of comment, I hope, uh, from the public because, I mean, our, Kansas City loves participatory government. So um, I, I see a lot of that that we'll probably get. And, and that would be, I guess, after the election is kind of my point. Right, so right. I, I think to the extent that we can provide some detail now, I think right. it, it, it's, it's helpful to get us through November. But, thank, but I ap agree with that approach as well. And I, it, we're, we're dealing with a shortened time frame, which is what sure. it is. So thank you. Councilman Fowler. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I will tell you up front, I'm a fan of more traditional architecture. But I have to join my colleague, Councilman McManus, in saying that I find this absolutely stunning. Uh, I, I do have a few questions about it, and to follow up on what Councilman Lohr was asking you, uh, I'm curious about uh, really two things. What's the distance between the two concourses and also the width of the concourses? Yeah, so the, the portion of that connector, when you leave one concessions area and you enter the other concessions area, is a little over 600 feet. And uh, they, you know, must be, it's probably... 85, 90 percent of that distance, you can ride on a on a travelator, on a moving moving walkway, two segments as 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 Pat said, outbound and also outbound and inbound, obviously. Um, <coughs> and then the width of the of the concourses uh, right now uh, are at about 100 feet um, at the at the departure level where the passengers will will be, and that's again something that that we will. We will analyze uh, in the in the validation period. Okay, and um, this is more well. Oh, follow up on what Councilman Lucas was asking, and also Councilman Barnes. Um, and we've talked about this uh, several times in public, but uh, since I imagine we're having a lot more people watch this today than we usually do, uh, could you talk about your job training program? Because I found that to be particularly interesting for people who. Uh, want to not only use this as work now, but as a springboard for, for future work that they might be doing on other projects. Sure, happy to, and thanks for asking the question. So the job training programs that we have uh, that we're looking at for the project here fall in two categories. The first is a pre-apprenticeship program, sort of a, a step-up apprenticeship program. So for folks who are interested in learning a trade, perhaps you know right out of hi high school, uh, looking to get a trade, we'll provide them the experience we had um, uh, my colleague Kwaku had talked about at the Chase Center, which is the Golden State Warriors. We had the Chase Academy, and we've talked about setting up here the KCI Academy. So same idea, provide them with tools, give them training, depending on the trade. It's anywhere from six weeks to about three months' worth of training uh, before they can move forward. So we, we've committed to do that type of training for uh, folks who are looking for workforce skills to then go into a particular trade. We also have the Strategic Partnership Program, which is for um, established companies, and it is a program that we've had for about 12 years now. We have it in five different cities. Kansas City will, of course, be the sixth. And what that program is, is it's effectively a construction MBA. Depending on the city, it is a five to nine or 10 month program. And we have um, classes that range from about 40 to 50 businesses at a time. And in that uh, five to 10 month period, we walk them through all the key elements um, that they need to do in order to grow their business so around contracts and understanding scope of work and insurance and how to bid their work and understanding exactly what their scopes are. A and then effectively, um, they graduate at the end of the program with, with the tools that help them not only bid on work on our project, but then the skills that give them the opportunity to bid on work for any general contractor here in Kansas City. Um, over the 12 years that we've done that program, we've graduated over 450 different businesses. And just to the businesses in that program, we've awarded over $800 million worth of contracts. So it's a program we're very proud of, something that we are committed to do here. Uh, given the length of the job, there will be multiple classes. It's not just going to be one time because I imagine more than 40 or 50 businesses will be interested in the program. It is also entirely free for anybody who signed up and is part of the program. The commitment that we ask of those firms is just like anything else, um, you know, they've got two or three absences and then they're out of the program. So they have to be as committed to us as we are to them. And if they are, then they get all, all the tools that they need to help grow their business. 
at the outreach event, we had a couple of graduates come and talk about their experience. Um, and, and I'll just talk about uh, one of them, a, a woman named Beverly Thomas had come through our program. She's from DC and has a carpentry business. Her first year in business, uh, minority uh, women-owned business. Her first year of business, she did $200,000 worth of revenue. After she graduated our program, she's now grown to a $15 million a year business. And she went from having no bonding to capacity to she can bond between 15 and $20 million today. So, uh, you know, a wonderful success story, but we could have brought any of those 450 companies that have gone through the program to speak. And so we're committed to bringing that training program here to Kansas City. Okay, thank you. And I understand you also have a bonding and insurance program for, for companies being needed. Could you talk a little about sure. that? Sure. So we've offered, um, and the, it's part of the community benefits package, to broadly speaking, financial services elements. One is the, the pay without delay or prompt pay. So for we know for all small minority women-owned businesses, or not all, but for many, um, cash flow is an issue. And so this program, uh, pay without delay, at the end of the month when the work is verified that a business has done that, we will pay them within 14 days. Um, and usually in construction with um, the way pay recs work, typically they, they could be 30 to 60 days in arrears, but our commitment is that we will pay within 14 days after the work that they've done has been verified. We've had several positive conversations uh, with local banks and we will look to partner with one of them to implement that program. On the bonding side, We've done programs before where we've partnered with um, our municipal partner, a surety company, and our company to provide, in essence, a pool that helps firms um, get access to bonding so they can bid on larger scopes of work, and we're committed to delivering a similar program here for the, for the new terminal. Okay, thank you. And the last one is purely out of my curiosity. I wrote two words down on my sheet of paper here because I'm looking at your roof that I think is really, really interesting. I'm going to show the two that I wrote down here so she, so Councilwoman Lohr can verify whether I'm right. I want to know if I'm right in what your um, inspiration was. Now, I'm not going to tell you what the two words were, but I want you to tell me what was your inspiration <laughs> for the roof. Yeah, um, <laughs> and I'm going to guess what your two words are afterwards. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, as I said to Councilman McManus, we are on a, on a journey. Uh, but our initial our initial inspiration um, was topographic. Um, we uh, recognize the kind of um, position that Kansas City has in the in the in the larger in the larger region and within within the country, um, where Missouri, where, where my father's uh, my father's family uh, was originally from, uh, is rolling rolling hills. And there's kind of a transition that happens uh, east of here, and I actually grew up at the other end of the, the prairie, uh, in in Denver, and so we were looking uh, at, at at a roof that sort of reflects that transition, that topography, that duality, and I think we will be moving uh, further with that if that if that sort of resonates. Um, that's the exterior exterior profile, the in, the internal, which obviously it reflects that that exterior profile. Um, that uh, that directly reflects it, but we're also looking then, as Peter mentioned, at other kind of calming uh, uh, and, and serene uh, aspects in the, in the in the center, in the in, in the interior of, of the building, and a, a setting for other other things that will stand out against it. Thank you. Those Your two words, or you have to tell us. He was right. He was right on. Yeah. One was Hills, and the other was the Kaufman Center, because they kind of evoke the design outside mm. of this. Mm. Uh, mm. And I will say, as a bicyclist, I am very aware of the Hills. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> so, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right. Councilman Ken Councilwoman Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for coming to give an update to us and providing these renderings. It's very helpful to have a visual uh, of what to expect. Um, just a couple of questions about the, the design. I know that you guys were instructed through the RFQP to follow the Exhibit K um, outline that was uh, agreed to by our airline partners and, 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 and a, a bunch <coughs> other stakeholders in this process. Um, but for public consumption, for those that may not be familiar with that, um, for particularly at the last meeting we had uh, at the 5th District on Monday, um, someone asked particularly, well, will this new airport um, provide some additional new flights? And which I know that's an airline question. Um, but that's an outstanding question that's out there. The follow-up question was, well, will we ultimately get a new hub as a result of this? And again, that's an airline question as well. But will this design um, support 
if an airline chose to select Kansas City as a hub? Does the current design allow for uh, that to occur, or at least the uh, um, an additional add-on for that with the current design layout? Let me let me let me take a shot at that, um, and I'll go back to the April 2016 presentation where um, Southwest said they specifically throttle back. That was the words that Steve Cisneros used: throttle back <laughs> connections in Kansas City. Um, and we've seen that those connections have been going to St. Louis. They've got 24 more, 25 more flights a day than we do um, because of the connecting experience. And that's exactly what Steve said: is that connecting experience is bad enough that they don't want to run connections through here. So we, I think, we have the opportunity for that. Um, there are no guarantees. The other thing we heard was uh, American Airlines stand up and say, we want to grow in Kansas City, but the facility doesn't allow us to grow. So in the short term, they were in three different hold rooms. We've done a nine-gate hold room and put them and three other airlines in a nine-gate hold room, similar to Delta and, and Southwest, um, to help them through this process. Um, they still have issues, uh, but I think there's all, there may be the, also the opportunity for American um, as along with, I mean, Justin's always doing air service uh, work. So I think there's the possibilities, but there obviously are no guarantees. But again, the question is, does the current design as presented to us uh, support that opportunity? Absolutely. I can confirm that as a as an airport planner. Um, you want that ability to, to connect on a concourse. It's it's like, it, it, look at look at DIA in D Denver, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, that United is on that one ma massive, you know, concourse. And that's obviously two or three times as big, but they're, they're there. Passengers come in, transfer on that concourse and out, you know, double loaded like the outer concourse uh, here. Uh, we also did a project for at BWI when Southwest acquired AirTran to create a corridor on the connecting, on the air side, post security um, to, to connect uh, their, their terminal with the, the, the concourse that, that um, that AirTran was operating on so that that could be one expanded airline uh, uh, area. Uh, so, you know, I, that's it's absolutely baked into the into the plan the way it is now. Good. That's good to know. Because the uh, what we're talking about, making sure we maximize our opportunities with local workforce, MWBE, all those things are important. Um, we would like to have a commitment of additional flights, um, and hopefully the vote in November would bold that confidence so the airlines would um, begin to make those plans for us. But the biggest opportunity we need to look for is how do we maximize this airport as an economic development center, which means a new hub, um, being able to maximize us as a, um, um, a thoroughfare for freight shipping and things like that through air traffic, um, and so that the design would support our ability to be able to source that kind of that, uh, opportunities for Kansas City. And I'm not sure that really has come out in the discussions that we've had so far, but we want to make sure that we are positioning ourselves to take advantage of that as well. Is that it? Councilman Taylor? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I uh, want to thank you for the presentation and the, uh, the initial design. We understand <coughs> a lot will change, but uh, appreciate that and the explanation. I have uh, really a request if you could ex expand on one of the points and then a couple questions for you. Uh, the, uh, today we're on the council floor declaring today Energy Efficiency Day in Kansas City, so it's appropriate we're talking about an energy efficient uh, airport of the future. If you could take a few minutes and maybe talk about some of the features that you're planning on integrating uh, specifically, uh, I think that would be helpful. Uh, the other uh, question, set of questions, I'll just ask them all at once. Uh, you know, this, you've heard from other council members, this we expect to be a transformational project as everybody does in the community that uh, supports it. Uh, it's got to be transformational, but it also has to be inclusive. And uh, I, I really like the fact that you're out meeting. Uh, you met in the third district, you're meeting in the fifth district, you're going to meet in all council districts. But uh, meetings and conversations are good, and you have a track record, so I, I think you can back it up. But uh, you're in the show me state. And so uh, we really need to see, I think, voters, at least what I hear, we need to see results uh, in local hiring. Uh, we need, uh, you know, I guess my questions are, I think, I think you've answered it, but uh, since you've been selected, how many minority-owned businesses have actually been hired, not just dis talked to? Uh, how many women-owned businesses have been hired? How many local small businesses have been hired uh, that are Kansas City-based? And if your answer is, I think I heard you're in the process for four weeks, roughly, that puts us at around November 2nd. We have a vote on November 7th. 
I just want to remind you're in the show me state and I think uh, voters are going to be looking to see uh, that this is a local project. I think that's why there was so much support for the hometown team and uh, one of the reasons I supported them. Uh, but uh, I uh, really would like to see uh, more concrete results rather than just meetings. And so can you maybe talk to that just a little bit more than you have so far? Sure. I'll take the second one and Derek or Peter can address the energy efficient uh, question. So the the outreach meetings have started in the last week or so. So today um, we have interviewed a lot of firms, but I'm not in a position to say we've awarded any contracts um, because we're just starting that process. I clearly understand the importance of local minority women owned businesses for this project into the community. And so that is where we are focusing. The firms that we've met with are local firms, um, whether they are minority women owned or larger firms. But th that's been our focus. As I mentioned, the MOU does have a local hire preference. Uh, and that is th the pool that we are going to first and foremost, just like on the KU project, where, as I mentioned, 94% of the companies were local and 98% of the workers were local. So w we understand that. We know that's critical for this project to be transformational. And so we've taken that to heart. And we'll um, have more to report on that shortly, because we recognize the importance that that could have to voters' minds in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we did bring on board to help us um, this week Parsons and Associates for community outreach uh, firms. So that's the first firm that we've br brought on board from a you know public relations perspective. Obviously, I know the the focus I think behind your question is more around professional services and construction. Um, but so that's as I said, more to follow on that front. Uh, but we we understand we hear you loud and clear on the importance of that to the community and the voters. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So. Um, we're obviously going to be looking at a full full range of energy efficient systems. Uh, Peter mentioned the um, the electrical load reduction that's afforded by the the the, uh, the clear stories, which you probably noticed are 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 north facing, and so there'll be no you know no uh, you know, direct sunlight through 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 those. Um, the whole envelope, the whole building envelope, will be um, will be highly efficient in terms of um, uh, infiltrate air infiltration and so forth, and maintaining a stable climate within the within the building. The mechanical systems, uh, the air handling and and so forth, heating and cooling is obviously a big issue in, in this in this climate. And so, one of the ways we achieved that in a recent gold uh, lead gold terminal was was highly efficient uh, air handling uh, 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 units with with um, combination of makeup uh, fresh air and 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 recycled uh, air. The uh, the the, the areas where where we think we can also g gain a lot of ground are in um, photovoltaics and sunlight uh, capture the the south facing part of those of those of those clear stories could in it could be uh, covered in in um, in photovoltaics Pat mentioned the the the, the uh, upper the top deck of the of the of the parking garage or as some airports have done other other PV fields within the within the airport, uh, as long as you control for glare for the pilots and and that sort of thing. Uh, when we did our initial analysis uh, of of this project, uh, water uh, came up as a as a as a big potential, uh, which would not um, have been done at this scale um, um, in locally recently, but that we understand that some of the some of the the regulations regarding uh, reuse of of gray water and so forth are in the process of being of changing and that's some something that we uh, we think and which we have implemented at at, at other at other terminals um, would be a big uh, uh, that may not be the 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 um, uh, least abundant of your of your natural resources but but it it could have a big impact on the long term uh, energy efficiency of uh, and utility use of the of the building. So those are those are some of the things. There's also areas which are not um, well, which they they do directly relate to trans transportation, which would be any locally sourced or produced um, uh, systems or materials that could come into the building and therefore uh, for the construction period not have not have that that carbon Im impact. So it's a it's a full range. Um, the, the you know the current energy codes are, and the and the lead um, you know they may still say 
you know, silver, gold, platinum, but mm -hmm. but the 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 hurdles that you have to get over for 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 each of those are with each version, you know, are successfully, you know, more more rigorous. So so that's that's a that's obviously good news for for everybody. Thank you. No, that's a good good uh, explanation. I appreciate that. Um, are you also? I'm just thinking as you were talking. Uh, we've got a. a KCPL is doing a great job with uh, the electric outlets for electric cars, and we'll see more of those on the road. Absolutely. I'm assuming that's all being planned into the garage portion of this, so there are plenty of space and, and spaces for that moving yeah, forward, not a, just a few. You know, it's really interesting, isn't it, the sort of almost a tipping point in the auto industry the last month and a half or so in mm -hmm. Europe and, and, and in the U.S. as well, more commitment to electric cars. So yeah. so that, that'll be a that'll that'll be a big issue we're also you know looking further out we want to we want to be sure that we have some uh, ability to uh, not um, preclude future impacts of shared shared auto use um, uh, sh the sharing economy the lyft uber phen phenomenon uh, also uh, affecting potentially potentially in the uh, the the how people how people get to the to the airport and i think that that goes to another one of the the another s set of the specific questions and some of the underlying issues is is workforce access to to the airport it's a it's a link <coughs> that from the from the core of the city it'd be it's it's something that we'd also like to be able to strengthen in the in the ground transportation uh, planning of the of the of the terminal Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thanks a lot. Uh, very outstanding work. Looking forward to more talk and more conversation and more work with you. Um, and we'll see you down the road. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next item of this, of uh, on the agenda is discussion of ordinances, resolutions, communications on today's docket. Any? All right. Hearing none, sir. I understand we have a uh, closed session. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, I move to go into closed session pursuant to 610.021 of the revised statutes of Missouri, subsections 1, 3, 12, and 13. Second. Did somebody second? Second. It's been moved and seconded that we go into closed session pursuant to 610.021, pursuant to various sections. Is there any discussion? Okay. Hearing no discussion, clerk will call the roll. Wagner. Aye. Hall. Aye. Lohr. Fowler. Aye. Lucas. No. Reed. Aye. Shields. Aye. Justice. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Kennedy. Aye. Taylor. Aye. McManus. Aye. James. Aye. Twelve eyes, one nay. We're in closed session.